Welcome to the Vietnamese. I'm your host, Kenneth Nguyen. Being part of a culture of nearly 100 million Vietnamese people in the world today comes with a lot of pain, proud history, and privilege. Join me as I highlight and explore the Vietnamese experience from all of Today, we have Crystal Bui back on, and she's here to talk about her book, More to Tell. And we talked about um, her work in a previous episode. Was it last year, Crystal? Yeah, I think October or so. The book talks about George Floyd and your time and your work uh, in the news business. And it has these um, subchapters about uh, the other officers as well. It's a very interesting um, write up about what went, what you went through at, at the time uh, in Minnesota. So thanks for coming back on. And I am uh, curious and, and can't wait to talk about all the stuff that we, uh, that you wrote in the memoir. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. In the first part of your memoir, you touch upon this idea of bored news loses money. And basically, after going through what you've experienced and, you know, you talk about the news company, it's kind of like a paradoxical situation where if you don't report on bad things in the news, it's hard for news organizations to stay afloat. But there's real human beings like yourself that's reporting the news. So the news model today is a tricky thing to sustain. Yeah, absolutely. And there was this NPR episode where they talked about, you know, how on Facebook, you can click on the little emojis to react to every story. So like a happy face, an angry face. Facebook had an algorithm, and I don't know if they're still doing it. I think they are, where the angrier the reactions are the ones that show up on your newsfeed because they know more people will click on it, more people will read it. They don't read the happy face and likes. Um, And I think it's almost the same model when it comes to broadcast news. People are into drama pretty much. So the more drama you can provide on TV, the more they want to watch. And is that healthy? I don't think so at all. You know, but that's the nature of social media and everything that is trying to capture our attention in the TikTok age. Mm -hmm. It's like if things are having to do with some deep guttural emotions then it picks at us and it gets us to to tune in but i don't think the world and life is sort of like that it's it's a lot more steady and boring um <laughs> and if we live that way then there's no books to write and then there's no drama to to kind of yeah. um create right yeah um I wish that were different, though. I mean, I do enjoy on Instagram when I see inspirational stories, but I think, you know, whether that sells not as much as the drama, the shootings, the tornadoes, the hurricanes. I mean, that's news that people can't turn away from. Um, it says something about our society, and I think it. I wish it were something that could change. But now looking back on all the years that you've left uh, broadcast journalism, what do you think about your decision to leave after all these years, like having some space away from it now, what can you tell me about life after broadcast living? Uh, I thought I would be really depressed because it's something that I wanted to do, be a TV news reporter since I was a child. I was always on this very ambitious track. I wanted to be a national network correspondent. I wanted to be a White House correspondent. Like it was this big goal that I had worked on with my agent to get there. And I was definitely on the track to get there. Um, I didn't think it was something I ever wanted to leave. But since leaving, I think I have been happier than ever. And I don't think that's something I would have ever guessed. Um, And luckily, I had a few managers reach out when they found out I started my own publicity firm. They were like, are you okay? You know, because you were on this track. I told my managers, don't worry, I'm fine. And they told me, which was really nice. They said, if you wake up in the middle of the night and you think I made the wrong decision, I need to get back into news. They were like, you will always have a spot. So that's kind of comforting on the side, but I have not woken up in the middle of the night and thought that, which is something I never imagined. Wow. So you don't really miss it, do you? No, I mean, once in a while, if there's like a really crazy story, I'm like, oh, like you still have this adrenaline that you want to like get involved with the story. And then I think about how I'm just going to go outside and play with my dog and go, you know, coach some swim lessons, which I've been doing. And then I have PR clients who are nicer and more appreciative. They're not yelling fake news to my face. (laughs) And so it's just it's just a happier life right now. 
You know, you talk about uh, in the early part of the memoir in the book, More to Tell, you talk about this idea of you trying to stay safe when all of that riding was happening and your manager is focused on ratings. And that's mm -hmm. probably a normal thing in the news, biz news business where the actual reporter is like in some danger, but the managers or the people who are handling you or trying to get this segment out is more worried about getting what they want and getting the ratings up. This is something that exists. This paradigm exists up and down the food chain in this business. Yeah. Things I'm probably, I'm guessing are changing, but I mean, at some point, do you think that there needs to be like a real line drawn in the sand? Or do you think this is just going to continue to happen? This is just part of the life of a, of a, of a news reporter. I think it's the life and I actually don't see it changing at all. Um, the thing is, so I talked about this in my book and this is what you're referencing. So when all the buildings started burning down and the riots were happening in Minneapolis and Minneapolis was ground zero after George Floyd died and the riots started there. I mean, I knew I had to cover it to my the best of my ability to really be transparent and show viewers what was happening. But the issue is the manager is giving you the commands. They're not outside with you. They're not yeah. standing in front of fires. They're not seeing the explosions from, you know, whatever is being set off. So many times managers will tell us, you know, we want you to stay safe, but can you go where the action is? And it's kind of like a wink, wink, yeah. nudge, nudge. They're never like, hey, Crystal, we want you to get into some danger because that brings ratings. People can't turn off the TV. The perception is like, oh, look at this beautiful reporter. Oh my God, she's in danger. Like people can't look away from that. You know, they want to see what happens to me. They want to see if I'm caught in tear gas. So it sells. Um, but I think that is the issue too, is there are code words. And if you don't follow it, suddenly your job could be in jeopardy because they're like, well, if you don't want to do it, we'll find a younger, eager reporter who will get closer to the fire. So you're replaceable. Know that. Um, so I think there is a pressure to succeed. And I think I did really well, like watching my clips, watching how brave I was watching the type of coverage that I did, you know, and I won awards for that coverage, but it can't be lost on us to know that I wasn't not in danger and that the managers didn't give me subtle commands to be more in danger because people want to see that. Yeah. And that sounds like the nature of the business. I mean, how can you get close to a danger zone, but be 100% safe, right? That's like being a wide receiver and not wanting to get hit, <laughs> right. right? It's right. just part of, it literally is intrinsically woven into the nature of the work that you do in order yep. to get to the juicy stuff you have to, but see, and that's the thing of the, the paradox of the news business. It's like, the danger and the darkness and the things that attract us to mm -hmm. viewer viewership is the very thing that is kind of like not good for us if you think yep. about it. Yeah. And when I talked about safety too, like a few things that I didn't understand that I wrote about in my book is like, so I was on the ground level, right? I was the eyes and ears on the ground. I stayed very close. I followed the rioters even. Um, I followed the tear gas. I followed, you know, to bring comprehensive coverage. What I didn't understand is that we had choppers in the air. So you would hear the reporter in the air being like, I'm seeing explosions. And they're like, let's go to Crystal on the ground. And I literally would stand there and be like, there was an explosion behind me. And so it's like, how aggressive do you need to be to get this coverage? Or can you do it in a safer manner? Because let's be honest, the chopper in the air, he was filming on the ground. You could see stuff popping, but what sells is Crystal is standing near it, right? And so that's the problem is there were ways to tell the story of the violence, the riots that happened after George Floyd was killed, but in a safer manner. But that safer manner isn't what sells. So I think that's the problem is there are ways that we can bring good coverage without putting people in danger. But like you said, in a way we signed up for that danger. I just don't think reporters knew how dangerous it would be. We knew there would be danger. We just didn't really understand what the demands would be and what the instructions would be. And and I can imagine at the award shows for these news um the, for the news business, people are probably getting 
awards for mm -hmm. coming very, very close to yeah. danger and dying. I won a lot of awards for my George Floyd coverage. And I remember even one night before we were going out, in my mind, I knew the coverage I could bring would win an award. And I had several coworkers say, do not be stupid. This is not the night for you to be doing this. But reporters know that's how you establish the name in a way. That's how you build credibility. You know, you're gutsier. It's like picture a firefighter running in to save someone, even though he's like this might he or she might not be like this is not a great idea, but I'm going to do it because it's a part of my job, even though I'm risking my life. Are there safer ways to do it? Maybe, but I'm going to play hero, right? In a way, that's what reporters were expected to do as well. What other things that are similar to the idea of danger that exists, perhaps maybe in the political backdrop of managing management and, and reporters? What other kind of like things that are just even beyond the dangers you know i'm sure that there's like political ideologies that are different or mm -hmm. just management differences or you know the things that in more to tell you know you could there's subtle things that you write about but what are things that are just beyond the physical dangers of it dangerous to sort of your career dangerous to mm -hmm. the future of, of 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 your trajectory as as a professional yeah, so I wrote about the fact that um, sometimes I think reporters do stuff that is so unacceptable for a regular citizen to do, but it's our job requirement to do it. So I talked about how during George Floyd's uh, funeral or procession, we're expected to go up to family and friends and borderline harass them to get them on TV. So now when I think about when my aunt died, swear to God, if a reporter shoved a camera in my face and said, how do you feel about this? What do you, you know, to try and get tears because tears also sell on TV, I would have lost my mind, but we're expected to do that because we want the emotion. We want the drama. And while that makes sense, it is so disrespectful for the yeah. families that you, Kenneth, would never run to a family in yeah. a funeral that you didn't even know and say, how do you how do you feel about this? You know, so the stuff that we're asked to do as reporters is not acceptable in other in the other situation, yeah. pretty much for anyone else. But then, OK, so now what what is the future? What should be the future of the news business as somebody who stepped away for from it? Mm -hmm. Now, from your perspective as a veteran who's been in it and somebody who exists outside of it, because we need the news. Mm -hmm. But now, what would your vision be of a news organization that if you created something from scratch, mm -hmm. what would you what would be your ideal sort of situation? It's so hard because um, I was following, it was actually a TV news reporter. I believe it was like her aunt-in-law or, or someone um, that was killed during, I believe it was the Lunar New Year shooting. And she was like, oh my God, like being on the other side of it and realizing how many reporters call you, interrupt your day, want these interviews. Like, I think she wrote on Twitter that it gave her such good perspective to like what she was doing to other people. And a suggestion she made was, and I don't think this will ever happen. She was like, there should just be one news reporter that makes that approach. And then that tape should be shared with everyone. There shouldn't be five people asking her the same questions. Now here's the issue. We all want something different because yeah. if I'm airing the same thing that five other TV stations are airing, why would you watch me? Maybe you, you rather watch that on CNN, on Fox. So while I think that what she said was so humanizing and true and that she really got perspective being a victim as opposed to being a TV news reporter, do I think it's going to change? No, uh, not at all. I think her suggestion was great, though. I think, you know, if we had one representative, so to speak, of the media approach the family and then drop it right after, that would change. But you see in the movies where there's like a gaggle of reporters running yeah. after a family, like... Imagine being chased by all those reporters, you know, as opposed to just one person saying, can you do this interview? We will share this tape with everyone. I mean, it's not going to happen, but I think it's a logical way. And a Yeah. And I don't want to simplify this situation. I don't want to make it overly simplistic, but the news is affecting 
everybody's mental health from mm-hmm. Vietnam to the US to yep. Ukraine to mm-hmm. Mexico to anywhere you go. I think the news is affecting everybody's mental health. And I think the modern news is doing that. You know, not so much Walter Cronkite's age and day and age, the way they did the reporting. I think today it's such such a, uh, you know, they're baiting everybody uh, mm-hmm. emotionally to get in. And I, I, I think, you know, I, I don't watch, I try not to watch news at all anymore. And if I do it, I, I try to read the news. Like, you know, I just try to, same. to read. Same. I think um, there's a couple Instagram accounts and uh, I'm like divided on how I, so I'd love to hear your perspective too, where they air videos of the Asian hate crimes. Yeah. And on one hand, I truly believe that that knowledge needs to be out there. Um, do I need to see these videos like every day? I don't know. Like, I don't know that it's healthy for me to see it. I think you're right. But does that incentivize me to get out there and protect the Asian community more? Like maybe, you know, I I don't know what the solution is, but I know, but do I want to, is it healthy for us to be watching all these Asian hate crimes? Like, I don't, I don't think so, but yeah, Is I'm it torn necessary? too, Crystal. I mean, I, I don't I'm know. so torn about no. this. Yeah. On one hand, we need to to let people know that hey, we're watching. We're like mm-hmm. as the Asian community, we're watching, and we're recording, and we're making light. We, we're we're making we're bringing all this stuff to light. But as a community yeah. member myself, watching it is painful, and mm-hmm. somehow I know that as I'm watching it, other people and other groups of hateful groups are probably being inspired by it too to do more Mm -hmm. of that kind of hateful action so god it's just so it's such a a a debatable thing i mean it's like all things that are good have the bad and you know it's Mm -hmm. everything's a curse it's a blessing but in blessings there's curses so i i don't know like this whole stop i mean it's jackfruit and um Jack Fu does a yeah, lot of that yeah. coverage, you know, which is um, they do good work. But after a while, you get desensitized to this Asian hate and mm-hmm. you're just like, oh, it's just another day, like school shootings, you know, or mass shootings. Yeah. It's just like, do we need to be talking about this all the time or something just has to hap- change? I think it's also like, how angry can I keep being? I mean, I felt like when I was a TV news reporter, And I wrote about this in the book, like even within the industry, there is so much sexism and racism. Like in my newsroom, I was the only Asian reporter out of 30 plus reporters, maybe even 40. There was only one black girl. And so we're fighting this different front of we need to bring this coverage, right? It's so important to bring the coverage of the black community, the Asian community. But my God, if there are only two of us, like, how do we stand up to all these other people that don't think we're important, that are going to keep us down, that will try and do things that stop the stories? I mean, it, it's a it's always a fight. And I think at a certain point, you're like, can, can I keep fighting or, or what can I do? And I feel like becoming a TV news reporter was one of the best decisions I could have made. But leaving is also one of the best decisions I could have made. It's like that that adage about buying a boat. The two best days are when you bring the boat home, and the other best day is when you sell the boat. <laughs> yeah, because everything in between is just an uphill battle: maintenance, the fees, yep. the docking fees, and and the accidents that happen. It's just a mountain of things. But you know, you look back on on your career, though it's made you become who you are today, mm-hmm. and that experience, mm-hmm. you know. Although tough and and difficult, you know, it's uh, it's it, it was it's part of who you are. And another thing I wanted to talk about, since you're talking about gender and you're talking about um, sex, and you know, I want to segue into this idea, this idea of of the character Dane that comes into the book. You're and killing I mean, can me. Talk, you're can we killing me. That? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> you're like I'm. Uh, I should have known, Kenneth. It's the but juicy I, parts of the book, right? And people want to know, like, what's crazy? And I'll just preface this real quick. I thought people would want to know about George Floyd. I thought that was the meat of the book. Like, that's the compelling part. But for some reason, all the critics that have been reviewing the book, they are, like, in it with my personal life. And so a part of me is like, should I have written more about 
my relationships, you know, what, what have you. And when I think about the book again, I'm like, maybe I should have included more of that, but it's hard to be a news reporter because for almost 10 years, I wasn't doing stories about myself. I was doing stories about suddenly uh, this book was about myself. And as you mentioned, a romantic relationship that people really want to know about. Well, here's the thing, right? We are looking at humans on screen that are not acting like humans. If you think about it, right? They're just, yep. they're just yep. a talking face. They're not really real. They're just some avatar of a company that's mm -hmm. shooting out information to, to yeah. get us all riled up emotionally. But when one of those not real, quote unquote, not real people write about their love life in conjunction with some real life shit, that's when it becomes so highly charged. So now, I yep. mean, you get what I'm saying? I do. So I think for so long, like you said, I was Crystal Bowie, the news reporter. Nothing else. Crystal Bowie, the news reporter. People recognized in my street, in the street, Crystal Bowie, the news reporter, right? And I wrote about how that identity was not real. And people don't get that. It was a character that I had made. Crystal Bowie, the news reporter, yeah. was a character that I played. And it's parts of me, right? It, it's real, but it's not the whole me. And so I wrote about how, you know, you see Crystal Bowie, the reporter on TV, and you think she's brave. She's smart. She's outgoing. She's gutsy. Maybe she's inspiring. And then I wrote about my first date with Dane. And I'm like, I'm shy. I'm awkward. I'm uncomfortable. Like, I don't like anything about a first date. And I think it shocked people where they're like, we didn't know you were shy. And I'm like, well, because I wasn't playing a role of a brave news reporter. I was just me who is still the shy person, perhaps from high school that, you know, sat and ate lunch by herself. Like it's not the same person. It gives us a contrast, a real life contrast of a human behind mm -hmm. the coverage that we're watching on the news, you know, and especially when it's heavy material, like the George Floyd coverage, it offers a sense of levity and humanity, mm -hmm. you know, that, hey, the person delivering this information to us actually has like a love life and actually has like real feelings and is yeah. a real human being behind all of this heavy shit that we're like getting sensory overload from. We're, we're, we're getting it, but let's not forget that behind this human being that there's a real life that's happening. And that's, mm -hmm. I think that's what draws, I mean, for me, that's what draw, drew me into like, I'm like flipping the pages. I'm like, all right, cool. Like I'm reading about George. Yeah, you're like, tell me more about her. About, yeah. yeah right. I want to hear more about Dane. Right. And that's, that's sort of like what, what I'm going through as a reader. Yeah. There's other elements I thought was interesting that people didn't realize. So I talked about how my first on-air TV job, I was only making $21,000, which is actually much more than people who were only making $19,000. So we were making basically minimum wage, maybe a few pennies more than that. So, but then you turn on TV and you see me wearing a nice dress and looking, you know, my hair is done, but behind the scenes, I'm like praying I have enough gas to get to the TV news station. I bought exactly maybe eight dresses from TJ Maxx. And if I rotated the dresses correctly, you could think I had more, but you wouldn't know, right? So it's just an illusion. So many reporters are just trying to follow this illusion, even though behind the scenes, it's difficult. You know, like the other day I was trying to uh, sell some of my TV news reporter dresses because I don't need them anymore. There's a group for TV news reporters to buy used dresses that other people have worn for five, six, seven, eight, nine years. Like my dresses were eight, nine years, right? People were bidding on them. They were pulling them so quickly. So you don't even realize that essentially some of the stuff we buy on air, if you're making minimum wage, like you're going in the Salvation Army or you're buying other clothes, right? So people don't know about all this as a news reporter. So I think when you read my book, like you said, the the elements that I didn't realize people would like a lot more was the stuff that no one realized was happening, yet it was so common for news reporters. Like, we knew we were going to buy used dresses. It's, you know, that's that's how we lived. We knew, you know, you're eating ramen some weeks to get through, but on TV, no one knew. 
But but what's the major payoff eventually? Like when you first get started, your first two years, and you're like living paycheck to paycheck, and you're struggling. What is usually the end goal of an on-air broadcast journalist? Yeah, I think it's what we define as making it. And I think for me, it was to be a White House correspondent. And, you know, how much do White House correspondents make compared to their actual hours of following Biden all the time? Like, I don't know. I doubt that it's comparable to what they should be making. Wow. I have to think about that. Yeah. On that. I'm like, I'm dropping bombs on you here. Yeah. I didn't, well, I didn't, I, you know, these are things that we never think about, right? We're, we're always yeah. think that they're getting paid well. They look great. You know, they look healthy. They look like the, yeah. whatever they're delivering sounds perfect. It's clarity. Right. And with that mirage or that, that sort of that illusion mm -hmm. for the listener, for the audience members, you know, we all think that, people are doing well that are showing up on TV, but who knew that I think I could safely assume that the overwhelming majority of the smaller markets of um, broadcast people are struggling. Mm -hmm. I know even as I'm talking to you about this, I'm like, should I really be telling Kenneth about this? Because a lot of people are going to realize the story about me wearing, you know, used dresses. And it's almost like you have to get people to buy into this illusion to make it, to make the machine keep working. Um, but there, there was in the book, which you saw like in that first news market where I was making minimum wage, we all qualified for food stamps and we used it. And like, it's so embarrassing to admit, right? Because I went to a good university, all this stuff, but the managers know that you have to start somewhere. So why wouldn't they just pay you minimum wage, you know? And it was embarrassing. I mean, when my mom read the book, I think she was like, why are you telling people this? You know, or she's like, I didn't know that. And I really didn't need to know that about what you were going through. Because it's not something I want to tell people. You know, I worked so hard. I went to a good university. You don't want to tell people you're on food stamps. But that was what we needed to do to survive. And it was all reporters at my station. We were all like, I mean, what what are we going to do? Like, we're trying to figure out gas. We're trying to figure out clothing, makeup everything to feed this illusion. Guess what? We're going to be on food stamps. There's no other way. Um, I think that's hard to admit though. Like it's weird telling you that because it's like, it's, it is embarrassing to have to admit, like you saw crystal buoy, the news reporter, but man behind the TV, behind the television, when all the news reporters are like, what, what did you get in food stamps this month? You know, like, I think it, it's important to talk about it though. I think it's important because it might help young people who are going into the business have a better perspective, mm -hmm. have a more real sense of what to prepare for mm -hmm. before going in. And maybe the dinners that they had experienced before with their families or the places that they used to go to at one point, or people who are making transitions out of a cushier life and going into the news business, they might analyze what is really taking shape? Uh -huh. what, what's really taking place here? And I think yeah. it might prepare people. Um, and I don't think there's any shame in talking about the realities of a very difficult journey. I think it's, if, if anything, I, I think it's courageous and it's it's beautiful to talk about. I will say like, it is a little embarrassing to share that with all your listeners, but at the same time, surviving off of $21,000, I am not scared anymore. Even at being an entrepreneur, I'm like, guess what? If my business yeah. only makes $21,000 this year, I've done it before. I can do it again. I'm not scared. I know what I have to do to make it work. And so once you've survived off of so little, and like I, I told you, I climbed the ranks. I moved up to Atlanta, which is a top 10 news market in the country. I know how to pull myself up and I know that no matter what happens, I'll be fed, I'll have shelter, I, I know how to do it. And so it takes away that fear now that I've started my own business of knowing like, I, I can do this, you know, I can pull myself up, I can make this work. But like, should I should I be doing that? Probably not, you know, but it well, takes away that fear. The, the flip side of this conversation is also where you could also stand from a veteran's per perspective or anybody who's still in the news business who's gone through it saying that's the way we all pay our dues that's part mm -hmm. of the 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 requirement of becoming 
you know, a singer songwriter, a painter, yeah. of all mm -hmm. of those things, you have to have lived that life in order to get better at what you do, be given the opportunity, the, 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 the uh, airtime to go up and fuck up and, and, and fall on your face. That's mm -hmm. what they're paying you minimum wage to do is to get that practice. I mean, otherwise, how could you get the practice if you weren't working at, you know, the smaller platform, smaller right, station, right, right. right? I mean, that's just but part is, of the nature. Is of the there, is there a more humane way to do it? Yeah. I mean, if Starbucks can afford 15 bucks an hour, can can TV news stations, who I imagine bring in a lot of profits off of advertising dollars, even if they know that, can they not take advantage of young news reporters? I would argue yes. Hmm. But if you're focusing on your bottom line, which I wrote about in the book, why would you do it? There's no incentive to do it if you know these reporters aren't going to starve. They're going to find different ways to handle it. But like, God, there's a more humane way to get these reporters trained. You know, the first two years of my career, like what if it was $30,000 as opposed to 21? Yeah. yeah. You know, like, come on. Is it still happening out there now? Yep. I see reporters talking about it, even if it's a higher market, like a bigger city. Some of them are making $40,000, which... Wow. You know, and and they'll write about it on these groups where they're like, well, I need this job and I'm, you know, and, and I get it. You want to make your dream come true, just like a starving artist, right? You you got to do it. But I, I don't know. I just think there's a better way to do it where reporters aren't asking each other, you know, how do I make $40,000 work? How to make $21,000 work? Like, because you really are taking advantage of that dream. Are you not? Yeah. But it happens everywhere in the entertainment mm -hmm. business. At every at every rank, it's happening um, because people know that if you stick with it for a long time and if you get better and better, then there's a big payoff mm -hmm. at the end of a 20-year journey. Mm -hmm. um, the payoff is huge and the benefits and the power and all of that is like a big payout. But the bodies that are stacked along the way of those 20 yeah. years that you're going through the ranks, there's so many, I, I'm just guessing 80% of the people quit. And there's that attrition that is allowing for people to make major profits because people at the bottom ranks are working for pennies. But let's talk about, so I like your example of, you know, if you're an artist, an entrepreneur, you work your way up, but on, are they in danger? like I was right, making the amount that I was. Absolutely. I mean, there, there's got to be a danger fee, right? Like you got to yeah. pay me a little bit more if I'm running into five, you know, I think that's the thing is. But if you think about the young military men. Okay, good point. Started. Good. It's yeah, the good same point. Thing. It's the it's, same yeah, thing. that's like, a good point. They're going into battle for the same yeah. amount of money and then they're probably getting housed and they're fed uh, along with getting paid, you know, 25, 30 grand a year, which is peanuts to be losing yeah, that's a good point. the rest of your life. Yeah. There's all these like glory jobs that uh young people get into. Yeah, you're right. Or teachers. You know, I I don't mean to sound spoiled, but I think here's the thing. People know teachers aren't making that much. Yeah. People know blah 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 blah. But teachers aren't going into well, except some of them are in danger zones. Yes. With, like, yes. Yeah. But people know, right? Whereas I think the book dispels the fact that you don't know that and yeah. i think that's almost the interesting part is like i mean it's sad that people know even firefighters they make so little in the beginning but it's like almost it's common knowledge um and it's almost sexier to find out that a reporter was struggling somehow i mean i think that's a part of why people wanted yeah. to read my book is like it's like spilling some of these secrets that are so obvious. Like we all know my secrets. If you're a news reporter, I'm not saying anything in my book that's shocking if you're in the industry. What's shocking is if you watch Crystal Bowie on television and suddenly you read Crystal Bowie who wrote this book. Now you have two different versions that's hard to reconcile, I think. I mean, did you know some of that in the, the chapters? No. Like, no. Yeah, right? And you I, know I, the industry. Yeah, and it's like it's almost like when I think about newscasters that I know, it's almost sort of like they're statues, you know. They they just live perfect lives and they make a lot of money, you know. In my head, you know, um, Betty Wynn from CNN um, is one of those people. I, I haven't interviewed her yet, but you know, she just 
is an icon to me because she was like one of the first Vietnamese women faces that I, you know, consume the news on CNN. I see her, mm-hmm. I would see her all the time in the, I think in the nineties. And so I probably never thought about the struggles that she had as she was climbing the ranks in, you know, in the smaller markets that she had to, to work in. Mm-hmm. And obviously you pay the dues, right? But in the same yeah. uh, manner, what are the costs? Cause it's a big cost to buy in. Yeah. And why yeah. are they always stopping? You know, why do the news reporters end up burning out? And I that's that leads me into the next topic, which is this idea of like ideology. Like each station or company might have its political ideology. And if it doesn't fall into your kind of like it doesn't mix well with your viewpoint in poli- politics or life then mm-hmm. you're like living a very tough life having to say these things that are written for you or you prepare that has to go with the side of the news organization and it's not really who you are but you have to live like this double i mean is that something that you had to to live through yeah so i talked about this a little bit in the book basically that we had very conservative billionaires run our station it was a family owned station they were billionaires this is public knowledge it's on forbes they're on the list of billionaires so i'm not saying anything that's a secret um but they were conservative billionaires yeah. who donated to what other uh news agencies disclosed as very conservative republican efforts so when you think about how the media is supposed to be unbiased middle of the line but money talks and you want that money to mean something. Why would I throw thousands of dollars to a candidate if I didn't think somehow I would benefit from it? So one example I talked about was we got an email that said, and that I'm recalling this from memory, that they didn't want us to use the word protesters as standalone anymore. They wanted us to start transitioning to violent protesters, rioters. So we were given terms to yeah. use directions say because that's maybe the safer word we were giving directives on what we should use and the problem with this is i read a stat that said i believe it was like 70 or 80 percent of protests were not violent but if you're using the word violent protesters rioters over and over again on tv there is this perception that everyone who was against george floyd getting killed is violent is a rioter you know when 80 percent a stat said they weren't but we're milking we are milking that 20 percent so hard that if i asked people what the percentage was i bet they would flip it and they would say 80 percent violent yeah. and yeah. i would say t- about 20 percent. do you really think it was as high as 20 percent that were violent maybe i don't know what do you think I don't know. I don't think it was more than 20. I think it was. I mean, in LA, I feel like it was less than 20%. I feel like there were ri- a lot of looting and rioting, but I don't feel like it was 20%. I feel like it was a lot less. And I, there's just a few bad apples everywhere mm-hmm. you go, especially mm-hmm. in a chaotic situation. But for the most part, I felt like people poured into the streets because they were fed up mm-hmm. with what they saw. And maybe... Five percent of those people i don't know i'm just guessing Mm -hmm. you know really made the whole thing look bad and i think um i don't that that's just me i i I could be very i mean and then when you talk about president trump tweeting law and order law and order you know what is it i can't remember what he even said but all those tweets right trying to make it look like the country was more violent than what it was and then he gets more money from conservative donors and some of the conservative donors are media who want a law and order president, like it's a mess, right? It's a political mess and it's yeah. money driving it. All of this is money driven, you know, yeah. all of this shit, people dying and things that are moving around in the news. It's all money driven. And I don't know if this is ever going to change and the world is going to be a better place with the news, the way it's structured. Mm-hmm. I would agree. So, you know, and another piece that was very interesting, too, is how closely police departments are related to the news organizations and what. Kind yeah. Of control, so you are know. you talking about that chapter where you know, that conservative police officer uh, bragged about how he's been an officer involved? I think shootings. It might have been deaths, but he was bragging about something. 
and fake news, fake news, fake news, right? He went on Fox News to say that, but then he was married to a TV news reporter. Like, love is complicated, is that not? Like, to go yeah. full circle, like, that, it was crazy to to talk about that, too, because, right, like, public identity versus private identity. Publicly, he's saying news reporters are awful, I'm a police union head, stop fake news, don't cover my police department, blah, 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 blah. Behind the scenes, married to a news reporter. I would assume they're not fighting every day if they're still married. I mean, maybe, but... He he fell in love enough to propose to a news reporter. Private life. And you talk about this in the book of how these relationships with news organizations will make or break profits. Because if a police uh, station gets word of something and they can normally call into news and, and break it and let them break it or let them mm-hmm. report on it. But if you're not getting the call as a news organization from the police department, then you're not going to get yeah. to the scene. And you, you you talk about this in detail, actually. And that was a big revelation to me. I I, I, I don't want to give too much away about the book. It's but okay. It's okay. That was definitely one part of, and I could, you know, after, it's like one of these things where after you hear, yeah, after you read it, you're like, of course, that makes sense. But yep. it's not something yep. we think about before right. we, you know, before we read I, it. Yeah, I say that things are surprising, but not shocking. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that that chapter, uh, so people know the one you're talking about. So it was my first market, the one that I was making twenty one thousand dollars, and there was a police station, a police uh, where we were doing unfavorable coverage. I think they were like sleeping with prostitutes, or there there was something weird. I don't. There were so many stories, by the way, about that police department. So I, referring to this one, it might be, not be this exact one. Anyway, so we did an investigation on it. We blew up the story. They got so mad at us which is what reporters told me they stopped giving us information so say there was a homicide they just didn't give us information about the homicide so it was like there were consequences there was a punishment to covering them now here's the issue if we're not covering that news because we're getting punished and we don't want to lose to our competition right because suddenly you know say abc news has information about the homicide Our station does not because they're mad at us. Guess where all the ratings go? So then we have to think about, okay, do we want to cover this? You know, I mean, maybe, maybe we still cover it. I've had news directors say, I don't care. We're going forward with the story. And then I've had news directors say, we need to think about this for long term. Right. So then you have to think about what is not getting covered because they're thinking long term. Yeah. And it's this inverted i think this inverted model of villains will always get covered right they'll always get the spotlight but the heroes because of their humility mm-hmm. they shy away from the spotlight they they yeah. they hide and so the nature of the news business is that the bad stuff is going to get that projected that yeah. illumination and then the good guys you know, other other than the C, uh, he, uh, CNN heroes, right? Series. Yeah, yeah. Know, but the majority of the news is covering villains because villains yeah. have their day, and you know. Yeah. And so that's this inverted sort of like unnatural. It's natural when you, we think about the psychology of like what we like to consume as human beings, but it should be the opposite. It should be heroes should constantly be in the news, yeah. but they don't want to be in the news. They they you know it's they like don't. oh yeah. There was, um, so when George Floyd was killed, I talked about the female off-duty firefighter who tried to be like, you need to check his pulse. She was like yelling at the police officers, check his pulse. I'm a, you know, off-duty firefighter. You got to let in and let me help, blah, blah. So she really attempted to save his life to the best of her abilities, right? She's not going to get in there and try and get shot. You know, like you don't know what happens when you're involved. Um, so I called the fire department and I said, I need to do an interview with her because she tried to stop this heroic. And they said, you know, she, she didn't want to talk about it. And then, okay. So now I can't interview her. So I can't tell her story about how hard she tried to save this man's life. But then all the lawyers for the police officers, they're like, yeah, come here. Like, we're going to talk about how our client is innocent. Right. So they're on the news. And it's like you said, the villains who were convicted, uh, had all the defense in the world 
But the woman who tried to stop it, we never really got to hear from her. Not until the trial, I think, might have been the first time we actually saw her on camera. Um, I wish she spoke. I mean, obviously, I tried to convince them, but they told me no several times. So she never really got to talk about how she helped until the trial, which is, you know. Why? What pushed you to write this memoir? To finish it, because writing a memoir takes a lot of energy and it takes a lot of conviction and mm -hmm. a lot of assertion in many, many, many months. And it takes a lot of volition to mm -hmm. figure out what themes that you want to put out there. And just overall, the ability to complete something like this takes a lot of effort. What made you finish what allowed you to go and finish and, and cross the finish line? Yeah. Um, so at first I didn't want to write it or want to finish it because it was too much reliving it, right? Because if you're a good writer, whether it's nonfiction or fiction, you really have to almost like close your eyes and picture yourself standing there. So I'm picturing myself running from tear gas. I'm picturing myself speaking to sexist and racist news managers. I have to run through it. So I remember the dialogue. Um, I, did trauma therapy right away as soon as I got to Atlanta, which I think it's hard for a lot of Asians to admit, right? That we are seeking help for mental health. Um, I think that helped me finish writing the book, but the greater goal of the book is for everyone who has faced something like this and hasn't been able to talk about it to feel like, wow, that girl on television gets me, understands me, hears me was in a position of power, so to speak, to defend me, to say what she needed to say. And so despite all the sexism and racism I experienced and how much easier it would have been to just put this to rest and not talk about it, right? I'm safe. I'm in Atlanta. I'm happier. Why relive Minnesota? The reason is I don't want that experience to be in vain because how many other Asian news reporters, Black news reporters may experience the same if I don't call out my bosses? That's a big decision because, yeah, yeah. you know, it's blowing up the bridge that you crossed over, right? You you can yeah. never go back to any. Yeah. And did I tell you Fox News covered the story? Not that I want to give them a shout out right now because it was a very slanted story, but they covered the story and the book made top 50 on Amazon for journalist biographies. And even though I was like, oh my God, I don't need this on Fox News because it, it started chaos that day when I was like, oh my God, like stuff is coming in. There's all this stuff. Then I texted uh, my, a person who reviewed the book is a black female judge in Atlanta. She agreed to read the book to help me with wording, you know, whatever was necessary for a editing consultant review. And I texted her being like, Fox News just covered this. This is blowing up. I don't even know how to handle this. And she texted me one sentence back and wrote, I thought you wanted people to know your story. And she just shut it down. I was like, okay, that's all I wrote to her, you know, but she was exactly right. Like, of course, there's going to be pushback. Anyone who does something good in the world, it, it's not like MLK didn't have haters, right? You know, he wasn't just like, okay, like we're good. So no matter what you do, if you're standing up for something, it's not like the movies where people clap the minute you're standing up for something. It's not like that in real life. It's ugly. People are going to push back. Fox News might cover you, question whether or not you should have read this. But guess what? More people bought the book. So more people are going to know the truth. And if for a second I have to go through more pain, but more people read the book, then you know I'm I'm doing this on my own terms and I'm standing up for the Asian community and the Black community. And if I won't do it, who will? So it has to start with someone, right? You know, one thing that I was wondering while I was reading the book is, you know, when we write something and we believe in it because we lived it and we know that it happened, but did you have to go through a fact checker to kind of make sure that whatever you're writing, even though it came from your own brain, your own mm -hmm. experience, did you have to hire a fact checker to say, look, the way I wrote this, does this make sense? And could I get sued for it? Yep. So the judge who did the editing review, um, she brought that lens when she was editing. She wasn't like the lawyer review, so to speak, but she understood 
the way some sentences should be written. Um, the lucky part, which I wrote about in the book is as soon as I realized my managers were doing shady stuff, I started saving emails and I started voice recording them. So any meeting I would just hit voice memo. I'd walk in with my cell phone turned down. That was legal in Minnesota. Uh, as long as you, one person knew they were being recorded, which was me, um, you're allowed to record. So I just made sure I talked enough for it to legally pass the standard of a one person rule. So I recorded them. So if they want to dispute the evidence, they can go ahead. But, you but know, you can't. Has. How can they? They know who they are. And quite frankly, if you read the book and you're like, I think that's me, but I don't believe her. The fact that you think it's you tells me, you know, it's you. You, you know, because if I read a book and someone was making crazy claims, I wouldn't be like, oh, that was definitely me. But when people are like, why did she say that about me? You know, she she got it wrong. Well, then why did you recognize yourself? Wow, that's a <laughs> interesting point. Yeah, so there's nobody who's come forward to attack then. What are they going to say? That's you awesome. shouldn't be telling the truth. Yeah. Come on, sit down. I love it. You know, so, yeah, this is awesome. Um, More to tell is a book that a memoir that, you know, everybody should go out and read and especially in our community that has so much judgment around the George Floyd situation. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody should pick up a copy and read it to understand what went, went, went on. This is uh, an insider's perspective from Crystal Bowie to, to see and to understand more and to get a really uh, a grasp on really what happened during those weeks. Crystal, yeah, this is your so chance. Much. Yeah, this is your chance to know what it really is like being an Asian TV news reporter. So if you want a signed copy, go to more to tell book.com. So the title of the book, book.com, more to tell book.com. Type in when you check out Vietnam. So that's specifically for your readers. And there's a discount code for promo because um, obviously I want your readers to be able to get the book um, and be able to understand what we talked about today. So more to tell book.com and type in Vietnam for the discount. Thanks again, Crystal. I really appreciate you coming on today. Yes, thank you. Thank you for listening to The Vietnamese with Kenneth Nguyen. Special thanks to Brittany Tran, to Jane Nguyen, Catherine Nguyen, Tina Pham, Sydney Jamie, and Crystal Trin. Please find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at The Vietnamese Podcast.